I think I want to just start off by saying, you know, this was supposed to be a, um, an intro in New York. We were supposed to be traveling to New York uh, for this intro and we're really sad not to be able to do that. And we're really sad um, and nervous for what's happening in New York. And we're just wishing a lot of safety and that, you know, care and um, hope that things clear up there as quickly as possible. Um, we can't wait to be able to come back and visit again. Yeah. yeah. And that's true, especially for New York, but also many other places as well. I think the whole nation is anchoring down and sheltered in place, or at least most of it, or the ones that want to, you know, straighten the curve there. <laughs> so, um, I know, and it's impacting everything, you know, and I, and I mean, it's, it's, it's this crazy experiment of us all just trying some, living our lives in a completely different way than we ever have before. Uh, and, you know, there's so many emotional consequences to that, right? Like to just, okay, I'm going to just stay at home and be with my partner 24 seven and my kids 24 seven and stay physically away from everyone else and, you know, or just be by myself if I don't have a partner or kids. Uh, and it's really, it's a very, very, I think it's, in, I just see the way that it hits people emotionally that they had no idea that it was going to hit them. And, and so in some ways, you know, this being vulnerable piece is so important at this time because I think some people just like to be honest about how hard it is hitting people, sometimes it's really hard to be vulnerable about that. They think, well, this shouldn't affect me that much, or, you know, what's the big deal? I always just want to stay at home or laze around, or I don't even like to go out that much, you know, but it's really different to not have the choice. I think that's such a big deal. Um, and, and so, you know, if you're beating yourself up for any of your reactions to this, I guess I just want to start out by saying, please don't beat yourself up and, and, you know, and I want, and I want this, a webinar today to help you be vulnerable with the people that you love and care about about how it's impacting you so that you can get support and connection or, or you know people understanding why you're not at the top of your game right. even if you are an introvert and like to spend a lot of time at, at home by yourself you, you know if you have a family or loved ones that you are quarantined with you don't get to that to do that as well so um, this is time to be more gentle and the topic of vulnerability is so important for us to learn the tools to be more gentle and to learn the tools to be more, um, to learn how to speak when we're triggered and to learn how to share our feelings um, when we need support or, you know, people kind of get on our nerves. So, uh, so I guess what I want to start out just by talking about like sort of what is vulnerability and why is it important? Um, and, you know, it's hard to come up with like a perfect definition of vulnerability. I think it's more like letting out what's going on for you on the inside, right? Your thoughts and your feelings, you know, whatever you're moving through. Um, and also in the bigger picture, and we'll talk more in depth um, around what everything is that you want to be able to let out. But just like, not just trying to be this, you know, not having this wall that just says, okay, that's the world outside and this is me and I have to just deal with everything on the inside, but to actually be able to share openly and honestly about some important pieces of ourselves and, and why do we do that? I mean, I think that's the most, you know, cause it's like, it's not an easy thing to do. So <laughs> we have to have really good reasons to do it. And I think the number one is that um, it is the way that we deepen intimacy with the people that we love and care about. If, if we let them into our emotions, if we open up vulnerability, vulnerably about, you know, all sorts of things, then we start to create a cycle of intimacy where we're saying, hey, this is who I am on a deeper level, you know, because at the beginning of a relationship, I mean, it's different with your family, but if you're talking about an intimate partnership, at the beginning, there's a lot of marketing, right? It's like, oh, this is perfect me, outside me. <laughs> then uh, once you've been with hanging around with someone for six months or so, you start to not be able to hide all the blemishes. Um, and, you know, and, and so we just want to encourage people that everybody has things about them that are, you know, amazing and resilient and, you know, empowered and things about them that are challenging and 
um, scared and uh, and um, you know that people are ashamed about. So, so to be able to open up that cycle of intimacy and to share vulnerably who you are also invites the other person to feel safe to say, "Oh, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Oh, thank goodness, because guess what? I'm not perfect either. And here are the ways <laughs> that I'm not perfect." So it's a big way of deepening intimacy and. And, and also our vulnerable feelings aren't just about things that are challenging about us, but also, you know, things that we feel like to say, I love you is one of the most vulnerable things that you can say to someone. And especially if you don't know if they're going to say it back uh, or, you know, I want this thing sexually, that's, you know, very arousing to me. That's very, very vulnerable, definitely deepens intimacy to find that out about your partner as long as there's a safe space to do that in. Um, so I think those are big reasons. I really want to say that if you're sitting there and waiting for to fix all your problems and never have any issues that you um, dealing with, so uh, you're not in the right place because we really believe that no one gets over all their issues. And uh, we do believe that you can get more and more relate, you know, better relationship with your challenges and triggers, but you won't be able to get over them ever in your life probably but uh, you will have you'll have more gentleness with it so um this is why how to be vulnerable is so important because since we don't believe you'll be able to get rid of all those things that you probably think that one day if i'm going to be perfect i'll get rid of it it's good to learn how to talk about them and and how they impact your relationship do not wait until you're perfect to try to get into a relationship you'll never get into one <laughs> And I think the other thing that we really, really need from people um, who we love and when we want to be more intimate, the thing that we really need is empathy. And so, you know, oftentimes if you try to get empathy without showing any vulnerability, it falls flat. It's actually seeing the vulnerability in another person that brings out the empathy. So for you to show, hey, this thing scares me or this is hard or I'm hurt or, you know, to cry or you know, to look in somebody's eyes with that level of love that you have, like all of those things create the circuit of empathy between you and the other person. So that's another big reason why to risk, uh, risk being vulnerable. And another reason why it's worth risking being vulnerable is because it gives other people permission to be vulnerable as well. And that allows this yummy intimacy that we talked about at the beginning. Yes, create the circuit. Um, so why isn't everybody vulnerable all the time, right? <laughs> like, if it has all of these wonderful uh, potential outcomes, why wouldn't we all just be vulnerable all the time? And, you know, there's so many reasons why we have blocks to intimacy. Um, many fears that come up around showing these parts of ourselves, you know, fear of rejection, fear of being thought of as weak or needy or pathetic. Um, so we really want to differentiate between vulnerability and, you know, I mean, vulnerability in itself is actually one of the most powerful things that we can do. And vulnerability doesn't say like, hey, I'm putting my problem in your lap and you need to fix it. It's saying, hey, this is what I'm working with and this is what I'm dealing with and I, and I need to share it with you so that we understand each other better. I think that's the real difference, you know. Um, and also the association again for vulnerability it was it was for me i'm israeli so it was clear to me you know when i'm doing this work in english i don't have the full potency of the meaning of the world the word all the time but when i needed to translate the word vulnerability um to hebrew when i was teaching in israel it's like was all about like yeah they're gonna stab me in the back <laughs> <laughs> so I, it just like hit me like the intensity of this word and how it is so why people are afraid to be vulnerable but if we when we learn to really work with vulnerability as Celeste said there's so much yumminess and power in it so we want to we want to talk about why culturally people think that vulnerability is such a bad idea and why we develop culturally so many blocks to vulnerability comment saying you know maybe because the dominant culture teaches us to fear each other and I think that that is part of it um, and I also think it's because the dominant culture teaches us we're supposed to 
have it all together and um, never, you know, never need anyone else. And, and also a lot of times, I mean, I think men in particular get taught, like, don't, don't show any feelings, don't show vulnerability. And sometimes in families, you know, if you grow up in certain families, if you are vulnerable or if you cry, you just get like, go to your room or I'll give you something to cry about. Or so there can be a lot of training that just says, you know what, shut that down and don't show that part of yourself. And then if you're taught that a lot when you're younger, you know, it feels very dangerous. Like you might be punished or banished or, you know, rejected, abandoned, if you show those parts of yourself. And I think that's a big, those are all big fears. And then of course, just, you know, the fear of getting hurt. Uh, if you show these tender parts of yourself and somebody doesn't handle them well, it's hard. And, and I do think people don't necessarily know what to do when someone else is being vulnerable. I know when I have um, a new partner, I have to break it down for them, like step by step, like, okay, I'm going to tell you how I feel right now. These are the steps for dealing with my feelings. And, you know, it might sound rudimentary, but I've actually gotten a lot of appreciation from partners like, okay, I had no idea. That's way easier than what I thought that I was going to have to do, which is like fix all of your problems. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I really want to say that, that culturally people do think that when someone is vulnerable with them, they need to fix their problems or they need to tell them how they should straighten themselves or be better or behave better or do something that will save them from their vulnerability or from their challenges. And that creates actually those blocks to vulnerability. Because if I come to a friend or I, I share something about me or about our relationship that is challenging and they say something like oh you should do this and this or but the last time you did this that was so you know like they try to like instigate themselves that can be a block to vulnerability i realized we forgot to say did you say about the q a part no i haven't yeah we forgot to say that um down at the bottom of your panel, there's just a little cue there that says Q&A. And if you have questions, uh, you can put them, you can write them in the Q&A and we'd be happy to answer them. Some will answer live and um, some will answer just, you know, by chatting you back. Uh, the chat function is turned off. So we're not doing chats. We're just doing the Q&A right now if you, if you happen to have questions. Um, so I... I kind of want to talk a little bit about my personal journey around vulnerability because um, you know it's been long and slow and lots of baby steps and 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 I feel like it's gotten me to such a profoundly more centered and relaxed and um, capable place to learn how to do it. But you know, it certainly wasn't my tendency when I was younger. I had abandonment from both my parents. Um, and I, so I had a lot of abandonment terror. So when I would feel like, when I would feel hurt or scared, I was not, I would not be vulnerable. I mean, I would cry a lot and those kinds of things, but not in any kind of vulnerable way. I would break up with people. I would accuse them of things. I would blame them for my feelings or my fears without having any awareness that they were my feelings and that I needed to work on them. Um, and I didn't, um, I didn't know how to be vulnerable in a way that wasn't like, frightening uh to my partners or um that wasn't actually it was just like not real vulnerability but just like emoting 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 um so it's been a long slow process to realize that like the work of abandonment is my work but i can get a lot of help when i'm feeling afraid or uncomfortable or you know when i'm crossing my own boundaries because of my fear of abandonment that i can start sharing those things in a different and vulnerable way, which we're going to talk about how to do. Um, and and that, that gets me so much more of what I was dying for when I was younger, which was like this, this connection and love and support. Um, but I would just get, you know, I would get a lot of attention, but it wasn't really intimate connection. It was just my partners would get very frightened because I was so upset and freaking out. Yeah. Um... Thank you, Celeste. Um, my journey with vulnerability um, has multiple layers. One, I do want to say that I feel vulnerable now sitting and I have a painting behind me that I painted. And in this room, when I'm sitting, it feels like I have this like sun behind me and it feels kind of funny. So I feel 
self-conscious about it. So I'm sharing it with all of you vulnerably here. Um, I also want to share about my journey of vulnerability um, because a lot, um, I was shamed a lot and there was not a lot of room of even like showing myself and showing my body without getting criticism. Um, so it created a lot of like shame and stifling and defensiveness. Um, and also many times, even today, when I talk to my mom, she is really, she, it's really important for her to make sure that I don't make mistakes and no one's gonna embarrass me. So she's the one who took the responsibility to embarrass me and tell me how I'm doing stuff wrong all the time. So if I come with vulnerability and I say even something like feeling about our relationship, she will take this opportunity to tell me how I did something wrong the other time. Um, and that's, still very painful and someone asked here a very important question is there time not to share vulnerably and i think sometimes if you are with people that are not no matter how many times you tried it doesn't work i think it is important to take care of yourself and not to keep trying if it's gonna be hurtful um because some people you know it, it's kind of like a relationship is too it's a two two way street and people gonna respond, you know, like you need to learn who you're dealing with because the point is not to just like go and get hurt again and again and again, but to develop something good that works for both people. So if you are in an, in a relationship that the partner doesn't seem like they're doing anything to change and they and you have tried multiple times, there's no point in doing that. Um, so we're getting some really good questions. One person asked, um, what is vulnerability? And we're going to define it actually by breaking down what, what is it that you need to share in order to be vulnerable? Um, that's what we're going to do right now. And then also somebody asked, what's the best way to respond when someone's being vulnerable, if not problem solving? So that's something we can add in. We'll definitely um, answer that. Everyone loves your painting, Danielle. I hope Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Sometimes it's so helpful to just say it out loud because people tell you what they think and it's usually not as horrible as what you think. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just, you know, briefly to say like when someone is being vulnerable, mostly what they want is to be empathized with and understood, not to be fixed or apologized to. Um, sometimes, you know, apology is necessary later on. Um, and we can talk more about empathizing. But first, I think it's really helpful to just talk about sort of what is it what is it that you're going to want to share in order to be vulnerable in other words um what it, what are the inside things that people don't necessarily know about you unless you share them um and so i want to go over those one by one so that you really get a good understanding of what is required from vulnerability so um the first one is your past challenges and the ways that they continue to affect you so if you have experiences in the past where you felt you know that you missed out on something or were hurt by something or had trauma experiences and you know that those missing experiences or those traumatic moments in your life have created certain patterns inside of you or of protection or fear um, it's really helpful to let people know that you have those experiences and how they're continuing to impact you and you know how you're dealing with them and what kind of help you might need in dealing with them that would be most supportive a lot of times we try to hide our past challenges or we think oh why do i still have a problem with that that should be resolved by now um, and so we don't think that it's helpful to share i always tell my partners now it took me a long time to realize i had abandonment trauma i call it trauma now because that really helps me to understand my response to it um, and I didn't used to tell people that I had abandonment trauma. Now I tell my partners always that I have abandonment trauma because then I can say, hey, I'm having that feeling now, that terror that you're going to leave and I'm starting to escalate a little bit. And, you know, and I tell them at a certain level of escalation, I'm not going to do well, like I'll be beyond my capacity to uh, function very well. So, you know, if we can resolve it at lower levels um, and deal with it at lower levels, it works much better. So that's a way that I share a past trauma to help with my um, yeah. relationship. For me, many times, um, because I was criticized a lot, many times when my partner tries to give me advice and he's like amazing and he's helpful. He's like so essential to a lot, you know, like I love him. He's the best, but many times he comes in and he wants to help. And I, my, 
many times my first response is just feeling defensive and feeling like someone's criticizing me because that's how I grew up feeling criticized left and right. So I'll, like he knows that already and we talk about it and he many times because he knows that and I shared it vulnerably and I said you know I've been criticized so many times you know my parents you know how I grew up uh, and we had many vulnerable conversations many times what really helps me is when he say hey sweetie I actually don't want here's my vulnerability <laughs> I do not want to criticize you or hurt you I'm here to help I'm not your enemy and that's really like boom, all my defensiveness, it just melts away uh, pretty quickly. That's wonderful. Somebody asked, um, at what point do you share about these things, like in a relationship? And I actually share it pretty early. Like, you know, once I realize that we're going to be hanging out for more than a month or something, <laughs> uh, because I know that it's going to come up, um, that I will say, you know, I'll start out by just saying, yeah, I have abandonment trauma and sometimes I get triggered around it. You know, it's impossible not to trigger it in me, no matter what you do. So don't try to, you know, never trigger it. Uh, and I, I just want to be able to tell you when it comes up and, you know, ask for the help that I need. But I do tell people pretty early. And sometimes you don't know, you know, like I've been in my long-term relationship since I'm 20 something. So, you know, like, I didn't know back then. So this is like learning as we grow together as a couple, there's a lot of learning that's happening uh, to us in our relationship. And so, and I do feel it's never too late. It, all those ways are just ways to deepen the relationship. Somebody asked a really good question. Um, how do you make your actions and behavior align with your vulnerability? If my primary fear response is to fight, what, what do you do when abandonment results in fighting to hold on to someone or control? What do you do when the actions around vulnerability push people away? And I think that's, that's really helpful because we, you know, one, the reason that I call it trauma is what I've learned about trauma is in high trauma states, I actually have very little control over my behavior. That's why I organize my entire life around not getting into high trauma states <laughs> because I hate the way I feel when I, at, you know, when I get really angry at someone or when I, you know, the ways that I'm behaving are, are harmful to intimacy, like breaking up when I don't really want to break up or something like that. So I don't think that we can be 100% in alignment with our desires for intimacy when we have trauma, because trauma will cause fight, flight, freeze. And in those moments, we're not doing the thing that we really would do if we weren't in that state. So it's important to be gentle with yourself and to tell people, oh, you know, I'm a fighter when I get scared and it's going to look like I'm so mad at you. And really, I'm terrified, right, to at least let them understand what's happening underneath, even though, you know, if somebody's taking a lot of anger, it can push them away. And we have to understand that that is part of our challenge. I mean, I know that's part of my challenge because I can be a fighter, too. Okay, but let's get back to basics because that's really <laughs> high level stuff and we want to talk about triggers a little bit later, but we want to talk about just like what are the basics of vulnerability. Um, so the first one is sharing your past challenges and the way they continue to affect you and also your current challenges. So not, being, not having it all together, being honest about whatever your fears are or shortcomings that you're still kind of dealing with or working through. And again, like we said, we all have them. Um, so those are the first two. And then I kind of think of the next four as a bumble, bundle also. So the first two are sort of like challenges. And then the next four are, I think, so key to how we continue to develop and maintain intimacy throughout a relationship. And I want to say something in between the intimacy and longevity. I think a lot of times people are trying to just make their relationships as long as possible, as opposed to as intimate as possible. So uh, we're really in Somatica about um, committing to intimacy as opposed to just longevity without intimacy. Um, and these things, you know, vulnerability is one of the things that really helps you have um, intimate, you know, intimacy for as long as it's possible. It also, I want to say, vulnerability also really helps you create, you know, the honeymoon phase in relationship, people are so intimate and vulnerable and share stuff with each other. And that's the juice of relationship. And then when they 
get in long-term relationship, they stop doing it. Bringing vulnerability into a long-term relationship is the way to get the honeymoon back or get some sort of honeymoon or get some sort of intimacy going on uh, because it creates so much sweetness and depth and um, love in, in, the, in a long-term relationship. So the next things that we need to share in, um, in order to be vulnerable are our feelings. And um, I think a lot of times, I mean, I hear people in, you know, in my couple's work, they're trying to share feelings with each other, um, but they're not sharing the feelings at all. They're just throwing like accusations or, you know, facts back and forth at each other. And I can just feel the feelings bubbling up inside, but the feelings aren't what are being shared. And that's why there isn't empathy or in or intimacy being created by that. So, you know, what's the difference between sharing um, something and sh what's the difference between sharing a feeling or sharing something that's like couching a feeling, like hiding a feeling. So here's just like a, you know, a little example. It's like, oh, you're so sloppy. You leave your stuff all around the house all the time. I'm not your fucking maid, right? Like there's a lot of feeling underneath those sentences, but how they're going to land on your partner is defensiveness, accusation, blame, hurt, um, and none of those things are going to create the empathy that you're hoping for, right? Because what is that person really wanting to say? They're saying like, you know, I get that we have different levels of sort of requirements around cleanliness. And when I'm kind of like picking up the slack, I start to feel, um, you know, like used and unimportant, especially if I don't get any kind of appreciation, right? That would be a much more vulnerable way to say what that person said. And I'm I feel like couples work is just translating, translating, translating that all the time. But if you can translate it yourself and you can say, okay, yeah, that person is doing that thing, but what is it making me feel? Like, how is it impacting me? And you can share that vulnerably without blaming and shaming. Then it's, you know, that's so powerful. That's like sharing more challenging feelings. And then, you know, being able to say like, I miss you or, um, you know, like, I want you so bad right now. Those are, you know, vulnerable feelings that you're having. Um, or I'm, you know, I'm scared or I feel silly right now or, you know, whatever, just letting the, the, you let the other person know what your emotional content is in the moment. Um, so the next one, after. I do want to say people, uh, people who ask whether they're going to get to practice it. Somatica is really big on experiential work. Uh, we will demonstrate how, an exercise on how you can cultivate vulnerability. So we're definitely going to do that. And then you might be able to do it right after we did it or take it home and do it afterwards, like after this uh, talk is over. Um. Uh, the, the questions excite me so much. I'm like, I, I want to do all the questions. <laughs> but I also okay. wanted to get through the basics be first because I think it's so important to just have in your mind, okay, these are the things that I need to share. Um, my past hurts, my current challenges, my feelings. And then the next one is my needs. Um, and again, I, I use the word needs and I think there's a lot of questions like, is it a need or is it desire? Blah, blah, blah. I just think of it this way. We have all of the needs that we have and some of them are going to get met and some of them aren't. No. I know. I want all of them to get met all the time. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Um, <laughs> the only way that there's a chance that the larger proportion of them will get met is if we share them. Um, and again, if we share them in a vulnerable way, not a blaming and shaming way, like you never blah, blah, blah is somebody trying to share a need, you know, like, you never, you know, call me and tell me when you're going to get home. That's a very invulnerable way to share a need. Right? <laughs> but to vulnerably share the need is like, well, I, you know, like I start to feel it, if, it, if it's going to take you longer to get home, you know, I start to feel like a little taken for granted if, if I don't get a phone call or kind of know what's going on. So it would help me a lot if you would um, tell me, you know, just send me a text or something letting me know that you're going to be late. That's or, sharing a need. Or I get scared if I don't know where you are and I, my brain, you know, I have trauma brain, so I start to imagine all kinds of terrible things happening to you. So it helps me if you let me know where you are. Right. Much more vulnerable way to share a need. 
Um, the next one is your boundaries. And um, your Can I give you another example of needs? Because I used to be like very pouty when I needed things. <laughs> I was just like sitting there was like, oh, this is not going well. This is not going well. This is not going well. I want this thing to happen. And why? Like grumpy and complaining. And, and uh, one day I kind of sat with it because I kind of never got what I wanted. <laughs> I did that. I actually got a lot of annoyed people around me and I started to, and I went to my husband and I told him, you know, I kind of realized that when I get grumpy like that, it's because like, I really just need the hug and love from you and reassure me that everything's going to be fine. So he's like, oh my God, I would love to give you a hug. Just come and tell me you need a hug. So um, yeah, that was really helpful to find out that, that would, that's what I was doing, right? Yeah, or just like sometimes people are testing. Like if they knew, then they would meet this need and they wait quietly with their arms crossed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, somebody asks, for people in your Somatica program, how do you create space for participants to share their vulnerability with other participants? Is that an important part of the program? That is like central and key. Like, but like probably most of the time, all we're doing is creating space for vulnerability and really letting people show who they are. So... Um, as well as us being very vulnerable, as you see us here, we give personal examples. That's how we teach. We teach from vulnerability. We, Somatica is built in mutual vulnerability between the coach and the client, as well as between us, the teachers and our students, um, and between students and themselves. So boundaries are the next thing that you need to be able to share. Um, and that's telling your loved ones what you're comfortable doing or not doing. That's both inside and outside of sex or what you're comfortable with them doing or not doing. Um, and so uh, here's an example of a, non, an, a not vulnerable way of sharing um, a boundary. My friends are always telling me how gross you are when I'm not around. So it's like kind of <laughs> asking for a boundary, um, but with, you know, just sort of blaming and shaming the other person. And so, you know, a way to share it differently would be like, I get really embarrassed when you flirt with my friends and I would like you to stop flirting with them. Um, that's a more vulnerable way to share. And it's not really saying that the, what the person is doing is horrible. It's just saying it's not what you feel comfortable with them doing. So boundaries are really key to a relationship. I think a lot of people think of boundaries as like blocks to intimacy, but when someone shares a boundary with you, it's like you want to just thank them so much because it means that they're creating a space in the relationship where they can be comfortable to open up to you more intimately. So boundaries are a, a huge deepening of trust and connection. And for example, someone asked here, can someone speak to a vulnerability hangover? That can be a boundary because sometimes one person really want to be vulnerable and the other person is not ready for that. And therefore, that can be an opportunity to say, you know, I really want to hear what you have to say, but I'm a little bit overloaded now. So can we, can we do it in a, in a different time? Totally. And somebody asked, does trust factor into how much you tell someone about your vulnerability? And definitely, because if you feel like if you're, you know, if you're going to tell somebody something vulnerably, vulnerable and you feel like they're not going to really hear you correctly, that's the, that's the fast track to a vulnerability hangover. So <laughs> either you need to be able to trust that the person is capable or you need to be prepared inside of yourself for whatever the response is that they're going to have. Both of those give you the possibility of being, being vulnerable. Um, so after boundaries, uh, we have just one more and I think this one is highly misunderstood. So I wanna see if I can explain it really well and that's your capacity. So the, capa the capacity you have is sort of like what you, um, what you can do and handle in your life. And people have different levels of capacity. They have different energy, you know, even like with Danielle and myself, like she's the little engine that could, like I've never seen anyone more capable of working hard in my life. And if I like, I would do anything to have that engine. I do not have that engine. I'm like, she's like a marathon runner and I'm like a sprinter. Luckily when I sprint, I can sprint pretty fast. So I almost keep up, but not quite. <laughs> So we've had, we've had to have lots of conversations about capacity where I'm just like, oh God, I want to be able to do this next thing, but I'm dead. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of shame in capacity. Like a lot of times, whether it's like actually like keeping up with something like work or whether it's um, 
being able to handle something emotionally. A lot of people go way beyond their capacity to handle something emotionally. And I want to say, what does it look like when you go beyond your capacity to handle something emotionally? If when you're doing that, you'll know you're doing it. If like your day-to-day -day life is impacted by the fact that you can't think straight, you're stressed all the time, you're shaky, you're scared. You know, if you're in the, that state, a good deal of the time, you're probably beyond your emotional capacity to handle something in the long term. And it can really deteriorate you. I know that for me, I do it, I used to do that a lot in love relationships. I would just really be beyond my capacity and it would affect my immune system and you know my energy and I wouldn't be able to be a good partner to them because I would be angry and uptight all the time. So it's really helpful to know and honor your capacity and share it with your partner you know it's like instead of saying like why do you want me to do this all the time you know to say like that's more than i can handle i actually am not capable of doing that much so that's those also I, I really want to say especially in quarantine uh, you know for parents like wow like this is so intense kids young kids don't have space you know like parents also have capacity uh, you know limit capacity and it is really important to realize and acknowledge it because otherwise it gets you will direct it to your children so knowing that and going okay i'm gonna go on a walk i'm gonna debrief and share my upset and exhaustion with a friend so i won't need to take it on my kids can be really important so somebody says, um, I'm a fawn type. If I mention my boundaries, it just seems like people, particularly the intimate partners I choose, just act like that's my trigger or headspace or breathing room or things that they can test. So how do you say a loving no to people that are going to understand? Sometimes people won't, like they won't actually respect your boundaries unless they realize that there's going to be some kind of consequence. And I don't mean like a punishment consequence. I mean, just like, you know, let's say that somebody wants to process, process, process with you all the time and it's too much and you're overwhelmed by it for you to say, hey, I, you know, I, I can't process all the time. And then um, I need to be able to say I'm done processing. And then you have that conversation, right? And then you say they're, they want to process and you say, I'm done processing right now. And they just go, no, you have to keep talking to me, right? Blah, 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 right? They cross your boundaries. Then you would have to say, hey, you know, this is my boundary. And, um, if I'm happy to sit here quiet with you, but if you need to keep talking right now, I, I want to come back. I want to hear you at some point, but I'm going to need to go take a walk or take a break, right? You have to say like, you have to actually keep your boundaries is the thing. If somebody is continuing to test them or cross them, um, you know, so that would be. I almost want to say you have a choice to keep crossing it, but it's not going to end up well you eventually going to explode. You're going to move into shaming and trying to push them. You know, when boundaries, if your boundary is being crossed and you're not paying attention to it, you will eventually need to push back and it's going to end up worse than if you are taking care of your boundary. Um, somebody says, it seems like there's a lot of crossover between boundaries and capacity. I think um, capacity might be knowing what your capacity might is might lead you to need to set certain boundaries, um, if that makes sense. And also, I, here, here's one of my favorite questions. What if you and your partner have conflicting needs and you trigger each other? I think that's called a relationship. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> yes. The answer is yes. Uh, you're definitely going to do that. Um, and, and so it's not really like, how can we never do that? It's like, how do we deal with it when we do do that? Um, and part of that is vulnerability. And we teach so much about that in the Somatica training, um, especially also in the couples training that we teach. But, you know, it's like it's 100% impossible to have a partner who never triggers you. Um, so learning how to deal with those triggers, your own and your partner's, is really helpful to long-term relationship. And being vulnerable it, when you're triggered is one of the key pieces. And we're going to talk about how to do that a little bit later. Um, and I do also want to say that in our advanced training, when we talk about character and how like different personalities and defenses that we develop growing up uh, impact who we are in relationship different character types also have different ways and capacities and ways of dealing with vulnerability and boundaries and capacity. 
So I like this question, can we ever overdo vulnerability? What would this look like? And this is a very personal thing. Um, it's very individual in the sense that it depends on your partner who, or your family member or whoever it is you're talking to. It's like, do they want to do the same level of vulnerability as you? Or do they get overwhelmed by your vulnerability or not, right? So it could be that you have very different levels. You want to be vulnerable a lot more. Your partner goes, cool, I'm not going to necessarily do it as much as you, but yeah, bring it on. I love it, you know? Then it's not too much. But if your partner's like, oof, I feel a little overwhelmed by um, all the times that you want to share your feelings, then you need to gather your village of people who you can share feelings with and not only try to share it with that one person. Um, so it really depends on the other person's capacity to be with your vulnerability. I don't think there's inherently too much or too little. There's just like what is compatible. Another great question here, here is, is it possible to expand boundaries in our relationship and how? It is possible to expand boundaries, um, but it needs to be something that both people are aware of. It cannot be something that's done under threat or, um, you know, um, it can be something that's done with curiosity, uh, with understanding and gentleness that that person is really working towards expand the capacity. And sometimes the, that, that can be an opportunity to see that you might not be able to do that as well. It's not like, oh, I'm trying, that means I'll be able to. It might be mean I'm trying and I'm finding that I cannot as well. So being open to both options. And I think one of the best ways to help a partner expand their boundaries is by you being like the, the protector of their boundaries. If they feel like you really love their boundaries and want their boundaries, then they might start to be able to relax them. If they always feel like you're pushing, pushing, pushing on them, then they might get tighter and tighter and smaller and smaller. So it seems counterintuitive, but actually really going, oh, I want my partner to have their boundaries will help them start to relate to their own boundaries in a different way because they feel supported. Um, this is a question about capacity. And I think, again, capacity is really misunderstood. How do you go over capacity? Do you mean being vulnerable too quickly? Um, being vulnerable too quickly would only be going over your capacity if afterwards you felt like crap, like you had a huge hangover and you didn't feel like you were met well. Going over capacity is actually kind of you know simple. And I think we do it all the time, even on a day-to-day -day basis. Like I go beyond my capacity when I wait too many hours to eat and then my blood sugar drops and I get grumpy and crazy. That's me going beyond my capacity thinking, well, I can just do a little bit more before I have to eat. So capacity is sort of like our internal capability. Um, and when we really respect our capacity, we are in our best state all the time because we're not like overdoing what we can handle. So it's like, oh yeah, sure, I can handle you um, flying around the country for your job all the time. But the truth is whenever they're gone, I feel anxious and scared all the time. So if they're gone three times a year, I can handle it. But if they're gone eight times a year, I can't. I need to know that and share that, right? Because if not, they're gonna be dealing with a lunatic. I'm gonna just be like, are you okay? Calling all the time or like not being able to get my work done, losing my job, you know. So those are examples of going beyond your capacity. I also really wanna say that it's not a perfect science and um, understanding a capacity is not a perfect science because there are days that I won't feel as hungry and there are days that I will be much more relaxed when, um, you know, things that in other days gonna be threatening such as traveling around the country or not you know like it really depends on so many things so people tend to be very rigid around that and I'm inviting you to know the kind of we want you to think about it this is imperfect science and um, it hurts when you over you know when, when when you cross your boundaries or you hit your capacity and you're not aware of it but it's a learning process and um, and it's imperfect so I'm trying to figure out if we should do the exercise now or answer a few more questions. There's such good questions. Yeah, um, let's answer a few questions and then demonstrate. Okay, so uh, there was a question. Can you give an example of supporting your partner's boundaries and giving them the security to expand them? Um, I think the first, I think a lot of times when people are talking about expanding boundaries, like somebody's asking for something that they really want. Hey, would you be willing to play with dominance and submission with me. And the partner's like <gasps> overwhelmed and scared. And then in, and instead of the partner who wants it saying, 
hey, you know what, sweetheart, I really want you to stay within your boundaries. It's so important to me. And, you know, you can see what's comfortable for you. Maybe we just dip our toe in. Maybe you don't. I really want you to, to check in with yourself. But instead, what they do is they go, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. Why don't you just try it a little bit? Like, it's, you know, it's like, I don't know why you're freaking out so much. So do you see the difference? It's like, you see the other person is nervous about their boundaries. And there's a moment where you can go, oh my goodness, like, I get how, you know, this is scary stuff and really vulnerable. And I want you to keep your boundaries versus like, come on, what's your problem? Let's do this thing, you know? And that's kind of the difference between supporting versus the opposite of supporting, kind of like nudging, nudging, nudging all the time. Yeah. Um, so are there exercises to explore your own capacity in different relational dynamics? I struggle to set boundaries because I can't tune into myself and read what I actually can and can't do. I end up feeling overwhelmed after I'm overextended. This is like somatica. So in the training, so much of what we do is we break down because that's like, that's like, five, 10 different exercises right there. There's so much involved in knowing what you feel, expressing what you feel, knowing what your boundaries are, right? And so we have practices for each one of these things so that you can break it down and start to, to learn in manageable chunks. But that would be a whole other uh, webinar to answer all of you know, those questions, how to do it right now. But, but it is possible to learn how to tune into yourself. And sometimes you can't always do it right in front of the other person. You need some time and space to figure those things out. People are different when it comes to their ability to know in the moment what they need and what's uncomfortable for them. Um, good. Uh, what do you recommend to the person in a relationship with someone who has those intimacy, vulnerability, trust issues? As a man, you don't want to push yourself on someone, but you also want to show that you're not going to abandon the other person. So I think that's a really good question. And I think one of the first things that you can do to invite people to be vulnerable is to be vulnerable yourself. And, um, and it may take them a while of realizing, wow, that person's sharing their feelings and they don't seem really needy and pathetic at all. Uh, you know, so it might, it might be a while before they sort of realize, oh, you can do this in a way that really actually deepens intimacy. And, you know, and then you can just say, you know, hey, if you ever have a feeling or boundary or a need, if you ever need to tell me what you can handle or what you can't, I'm here to hear all of that, you know, and you just make the invitation instead of pressuring them. And then you keep sharing yourself in that way. Good. Um, so somebody says, Celeste, in the times that you've told your partner you are feeling like they are going to leave, did it help to hear that the feeling was validated and your instinct was correct, or did it take away from you feeling heard? Most of the time, people have not. I'm so um, sensitive to any potential of someone leaving. Most of the time, people are not leaving me when I think they're leaving. <laughs> it's like maybe just the honeymoon is ending and the you know the intensity is going down a little bit, and I'm like. Ah! I can't handle it. You know, this is how it used to be for me. Um, so uh, my current partner actually is leaving um, at the end of June. So I'm sort of facing a different set of experiences around abandonment, which is sort of like knowing someone's leaving. And that's been a really profound experience to sort of work with. In some ways, it's relaxing to me because I don't have to worry about whether or not he's leaving. He is leaving. Um, and in some ways that calms my abandonment, strangely, but also it's something where I get to keep kind of like, oh, there it's gonna happen. How do I feel now? Can I stay in the present moment? So that's something that's been a new experience. I wanna answer um, the question here. I'd like to understand the relationship between why someone brings uh, emotion, feeling upset state to someone else, but doesn't want it fixed. Do they just want to be heard and understood? And then how does the receiver of the vulnerable best help? So yes, it is very many, most of the time that people actually bring feelings, that's because they wanna be heard and understood and not wanting to be fixed. It's actually, um, it helps people to um, to listen to them because that brings the 
intuitive intelligence up because when our brain is flooded with worry, fear, anxiety, and emotions, we're not able to think as much, but many times people need to process with someone in order to empty the emotion and then we can get our resilience and our thoughts back. Um, and then when we, we are able to, you know, like my daughter, she's amazing. She always tells me, Hey mom, she has a way of like complaining about something. And she's, and, and when parents especially really want to help their kids do things right. So they give them a lot of, you know, like just do that. And she, <laughs> she's like, no mom, I just actually want you to listen to me. It's like, Oh, thank you for telling me. I'm happy to listen to you. So when I listen to her, I just see that she comes up with all the answers herself. So that's what also helps people develop resilience because resilience is when I dealt with a lot of emotional challenges, someone did not try to help me fix it, but instead listened to me, I learned that I am capable person to solve my own problems. Yeah, so listening and empathizing is really, really helpful. And that's also the answer to uh, what's the best way to respond to someone being vulnerable if it's not problem solving. It's really just trying to get what's going on for them and understand and empathize. And, you know, verbalizing empathy is a whole set of skills and we definitely teach that in the somatic training. So um, we're gonna be writing some articles about that coming up as well. Um, Cause it's important not to just hear someone but also to be able to verbally say what you've heard. That actually really helps soothe people. I'm like, oh my God, I'm understood and I'm seen. That's so missing in our culture because usually it's like somebody says something to you and you're immediately like me, 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 you know, like you respond with your stuff as opposed to really deepening and hearing their stuff. So I feel like, can we do an exercise now? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, so one of the exercises that we teach in the Somatica training is called the I feel game. And um, the I feel game helps you learn how to speak uh, present moment feelings. Um, somebody did ask, like, how do you kind of stay calm and share your feelings in the present moment? The calm part, we're going to talk about a little bit later about how to share triggered feelings, but this is just in the moment feelings. Because a lot of times we're talking about future, what you want in the future, oh, what happened in the past. But what we don't do a very good job of in general is just sharing with someone what we feel right now in the moment. So um, Danielle and I want to give you an example of the I feel game where we share in the moment feelings that we're having with each other. And then hopefully you can practice this um, with someone, either someone who's there next to you after we finish the webinar or, you know, someone you could practice with over um, Skype or Zoom or uh, once we finish the webinar. So so the I feel game is just saying back and forth how, not just how you feel, but also how the way the other person is feeling is impacting you. So it's like a circuit of like impact, which I think is something that we don't talk about enough, how we impact each other. We're impacting each other all the time. Don't fool yourself to think that <laughs> your tiptoeing is working. Everybody can read everything that's happening, especially if they've been with you 20 years, you're not hiding anything. So give up on that and start sharing your feelings. <laughs> And maybe I want to call it both impact and projection because some, some of the stuff we project on the other person and some of the things we actually absorb what we perceive them feeling. Sometimes they know that they're feeling what they're feeling. Sometimes they don't. Good. Yeah. Okay. Let's start. Um, when I see you glowing with your beautiful um, glowing painting behind you, I feel a little inadequate and unattractive. <laughs> so when I, when you said that, I was like, oh my God, I'm not completely stupid with this painting behind me. <laughs> it because I'm like headrest. <laughs> you know? And then I feel, that, so I feel relaxed and a little embarrassed. And at the same time, I feel like I really want to reassure you about how gorgeous you are. Um, when you say you feel relaxed, uh, that makes me feel happy. I always love it when you feel relaxed. Um, when you say that you want to reassure me, I feel anxious. Uh, yeah, like I kind of like a little short of breath. 
um, maybe I think it's a little bit like um, like reassurance makes me feel kind of like pathetic or a little needy or something. So. Hmm. So when you say that you feel pathetic and needy when I want to reassure you, I feel like um, a little bit like, you know, I have this tendency of, uh, you know, like, come on, Danielle, you're already supposed to know that about her. <laughs> uh huh. Mm, when you say that you're kind of beating yourself up about already needing to know that um, I feel very loving and connected with you. Um, and I also feel like then I just like see you're glowing and I feel proud. I don't know, proud is the right word, but like, like happy admiration at your glowingness. <laughs> 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 So I feel, um, um, I just feel emotion, like I feel intensity coming out. You see my tears and I feel intensity and I feel love towards you. And um, yeah, mm. I feel good. <laughs> it's like, am I like glowing in some weird way? <laughs> I'm the only one who can't see what's happening here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're like a goddess right now. <laughs> Oh, uh, so I feel a little shy when you, say <laughs> <laughs> when you say you feel shy, I feel, um, I love, I don't know how to, it's like so inspiring. Whenever someone feels shy around me, it's very, it turns me on. Uh, okay. Now we're like in a both turn on, turn on. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <sighs> Good. Good. Mm -hmm. okay, well, that's an example of being vulnerable in the present moment. Um, and you can see like when you allow for the mix of emotions and you don't try to solve the other person's feelings, but you just tell them what's happening inside of you in response. I think it really starts to weave you together with the other person. You're just, you know, and, and it can be sadness. It can be arousal. It can be inadequacy you know but it doesn't matter the whole experience deepened our intimacy i felt like totally definitely i feel it's also um it, it's wonderful to see how things flow and they can move from you know the sometimes when i want to reassure i you get more triggered or you know like it's really beautiful it's a wonderful way to see our patterns and how we tend to go to different places right I want to say fix and reassure. <laughs> it's not very reassuring to you. <laughs> exactly. And I think if we don't take those things personally, like if our, our partner has a certain, we think we're trying to help our partner and our partner has a reaction that's the exact opposite. We don't think like, I'm just trying to help you. What's wrong with you? Instead you go, oh, that wasn't reassuring at all. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I will keep that in mind, right? And and i not do it perfectly also, you know? <laughs> so won't always remember that, you know? So I think you can see all of those things happening in the, in the I feel game. And I really want you to notice we were only talking about present moment feelings. We weren't talking about fixing. We weren't talking about, we were, if we wanted to fix, we would say, I have the urge to reassure you right now, which is different than saying, no, you do look beautiful, right? <laughs> yeah. That's really different. She's mm -hmm. talking about her emotional response to my feeling of inadequacy as opposed to actually like doing the action of trying to fix. And that's, that's the really big distinction for the I feel game. Yeah. And someone asked here, um, how are you able to get to a calm state in which you are able to say in the heat of the moment, and I think practicing the I feel game is a wonderful way to do in order to um, first really start to see the triggers that people have. Your partner is going to have a partner, so your children, or everyone in relationship with and willing to do this. It's a wonderful way to learn triggers. It's also a wonderful way, one of the ways. We have plenty of those ways in the training and we we spend a lot of time doing that. It's also a way to see how you 
can stay vulnerable and share it in the moment as the trigger arises. So it gives you a roadmap to your triggers as well as a way to uh, cock to those triggers as you're talking. Because it seems very similar to T group dynamics. Can you speak to that? Um, so I don't know. I've not ever been in a T group. So I think one of I think what T groups usually try to do is create a deep amount of honesty. Some T groups that I've heard of, there's sort of can be this kind of calling on you on your shit stuff, and that's something that we don't really believe in in Somatica. It's not about calling the other person. It's more saying like how the other person is impacting you. So. Um, if T groups are about sharing what the impact is in a gentle, loving way, then yay for T groups. Um, <laughs> I'm for anything that helps people share their vulnerability and, and with gentleness and empathy and lovingness to the other person. So sometimes the calling the other person on their shit stuff feels kind of harsh to me. Um, but again, I don't, I have not been in a T group, so I'm not saying that that's what they do, you know, just that that's the difference for me of what's more healing. And if, um, would you do this game with a couple client and what about when they take to a negative blaming place, not like the beautiful empathetic? Yeah, of course, this is, we, we bring it to couples. It's, it's one tool in the toolkit of working with couples. Um, many times couple get uh, triggered and start to move into those places. And as a coach, we intervene and slow, stop it and, you know, help them go to different routes of communication. Uh, so I just want to answer the two sex questions that we got before we go into how to deal with triggered. Um, one of them is what if sex almost by definition has implications that are beyond my emotional capacity? Can you tell a trusted partner that you wish things were more easygoing or casual without thinking that you are untangling that well-earned trust? Or how do you tell a love interest that things have to go more slow, particularly in this fast-paced world? So the the the, the thing is, is that there isn't just one type of partner that you're going to be dealing with. And one of the ways to find out if someone is compatible with you is actually to share what you really need or what your capacity is, and then see if they're like, okay, cool, I'll totally sign up for that. If you try to hide it for long periods of time, then people will sign up for somebody other than you, you know, and then afterwards when you say, oops, I didn't, you know, I actually, that's beyond my capacity, then they might get a little bit upset because they would feel tricked. That doesn't mean that it isn't salvageable. We deal with that all the time where people have been hiding their capacity for years and years in relationship and then suddenly it comes out and it's like, oh wow, I had no idea, you know? And then you have to work through the emotions of feeling like, oh, I didn't, why didn't you tell me um, earlier? But, but it's still, you know, we still see a lot of couples be able to move through that and get to the other side. But I do feel like if you're out in the dating world and you know some of these capacities, to share them earlier, because that's going to like call out the people who are right for you and the people who aren't right for you, you know, and that's what creates sustainability in relationship if people can be with what you actually need, not what, you know, some generic person should or shouldn't need. And then how do you go about expanding your sexual boundaries? Or how do you go about expanding boundaries, especially your sexual boundaries? By creating a very safe space where you can slowly dip your toe in the water and walk towards the, from the shallow end towards the deep end with a lot of love and ability to change your mind if you decide it's not something that you don't wanna do. We talk a lot about boundaries in the Somatica training, both how to know them, how to share them, how to stretch them in a way that's safe and comfortable. So, um, you know, that's definitely something that we, that we work with a lot. What are some good way, good phrases to use to show the other person that you are listening and not judging? Like literally saying that, you know, especially if they're triggered and you know that they have tendency to be triggered around feeling judged, you can say, hey, I really plan to, I just want to make sure that you understand that if I say something, it's not because I'm judging you or do you need me to slow down and not intervene? Or it's really important for me that you know that I'm not judging you. So why does the fear of embarrassment and rejection prevent people about sharing vulnerab vulnerability, especially sexual fantasies to your partner? Um, I think, you know, we've, we haven't touched on shame that much, um, but shame and judgment, um, 
do create scary situations. And, and unfortunately, there's tons of judgment around sex and sexual practices and sexual desires in our culture. So sometimes people are right. Like they don't share sexually with their partner because they're afraid of actually being somebody feeling disgusted with them or thinking, oh, I don't ever want to have sex with you if that's what you want um, or rejecting you. So, you know, I don't think that those are totally unfounded fears because we have such terrible messages around sex in our culture and such judgment about what's the right way to have sex, what's the wrong way. And so, you know, when we help people talk about their sexual desires, we have to create a very safe space where judgment is um, taken out as much as possible and people can have boundaries. They may want to do something or not want to do something, but embracing the beautiful thing, you know, desires and fantasies of your partner um, is key to deepening intimacy. And it is a huge way that people show vulnerability to have those very intimate conversations about their erotic imagination and, and what they desire. Um, ooh. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about the trigger. Yes. And I think it's good to talk like, you know, just um, you and I, you know, have been in um, this uh, marriage that we call a business. <laughs> I feel like if anybody thinks being in a business partnership shouldn't be treated exactly like, you know, working with the emotions in a marriage, then, you know, things are likely to explode because I feel like our, you know, one of our biggest ethics um, in our business has been to share vulnerably. And I feel like that's why we've been able to work together so well and so long. Um, and just want to share that someone yesterday asked me, um, one of our students told me, Hey, Danielle, how, like, how did you find Celeste? <laughs> and I said, you know, and I said, it's almost like you're asking me, how did I find my husband? <laughs> you know, like some of it was found and like we met, but then like developing what we developed together. And then like, he, we are constantly having vulnerable conversations with each other. We constantly talk about our capacities and boundaries we constantly talk about how we get triggered we constantly talk about our differences and that what allows us to keep cultivating the relationship and i do know lots of sayings that talk about um you know it's business and you're not supposed to do it like that but we our dream is to even change the way that people do business with each other because that will create so much more gentleness and people feeling honored and respected with their contribution and the differences as opposed to just like, you know, like landing on people from top to bottom. I think that, you know, I mean, we trigger the shit out of each other, obviously, because we are all, you know, working on a daily basis on all of this together. And, um, and I feel like I've been able to say things to you that like, I never thought I would be able to say to any other person about the way that I've been triggered in our relationship and, and that we've been able to work through it, you know, just because like, I'm kind of like, I don't know, I'm easily irritated. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> easily yeah. irritated. And you know, so it's like, I'm like not that great at really long term relationships. They kind of suck. Um, where it's like, you know, the constant um, connection. So to be able to say like, oh, I'm just getting triggered by like everything right now. Oh, you know, just like the fact that you're answering my texts is triggering me. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. amazing because I feel like so easily judged, you know, and there's something about our relationship that I kind of pretty much never or most never don't, don't feel judged by you I, because you really own it and you say that it's your trigger and it's not because I'm this annoying person who constantly, you know, tells you what to do and texts you <laughs> with everything that I want to do, right? Yeah. So I never feel like you're blaming me or judging me. It usually feels like something that you, you own your capacity and you own your style and you own your, you being irritated. So it makes it so much easier. And I think that's so key to, to um, being able to share, you know, and be calm enough to say what's going on for you and trigger. And firstly, I just want to say, I think learning how to share vulnerably in the midst of a trigger may be one of the hardest things that I've ever done. And still I'm like, you know, Oh, only like decent at it. So I just want to for really reassure people that like if you're trying at all, if you're really looking at like what's touching you, like if you're doing anything other than just the immediate 
protective habit, like that's triumphant because it is so hard to say in the midst of a trigger, like I'm terrified right now. I'm so scared that you're leaving me like, or, you know, I, I, I can't handle, um, well, so I was, my partner and I got into it the other night and I could tell that he was upset about something about me. And that just completely, you know, like shakes my abandonment stuff up. Right. But he wouldn't tell me what it was. And I asked him a couple of times and then I just realized he wasn't going to share. And so I just lied in bed next to him the whole night, like frozen and didn't sleep and did a couple of little shitty things. Like he really likes to sleep with a fan. I turned the fan off. <laughs> <laughs> just love that you can see that. <laughs> Because I was like, you know, I don't know if, if, if he's going to not tell me then, you know, and I'm lying here and I can't sleep. Well, it's easier for me to sleep with the fan off. So fuck him, you know, like that kind of stuff, which he did actually tell me the next day did trigger him, you know. So, um, so you know, in that time, like I, I couldn't bring up my voice. I couldn't say, hey, I'm so freaked out right now, you know, like this is really uncomfortable for me. But the next day when we talked about it, I said, look, if, if you need sometimes to have space from me when you're triggered by me and you're not ready to talk, like I'm going to have to like go, you know, I'm going to have to just go to my house because in my house I can do all my little coping mechanisms. <laughs> um, but lying next to you in bed frozen for eight hours is not is way beyond my capacity. And I'm proud that I was only as, you know, only poked you as much as I did with my little fan behavior, <laughs> but, but I can't do that. So we have to think of a different approach um, in those moments. Either you need to share vulnerably what's going on inside of you, or we need to have a little bit more space so that I can take care of myself in that. Because I know I'll turn into like a, I'll do shittier things. Like I'll start to escalate. So it's pretty proud that I only did my little fan thing. Um, but I know myself enough to know that I could get more uh, punitive, vindictive or whatever. Like I get, I get pretty vindictive and in, in when I'm triggered. Um, so, you know, that was like sharing vulnerably as close to the moment as I could, um, which is what I think is another triumph. But if in the moment of the intensity, if you can share vulnerably what's happening inside of you, like I'm starting to, um, I have one couple, I'm so proud of them. Like one, you know, the one would get really afraid and she would just start attacking her partner. And this last time she said, you know, I just feel like the, the little girl inside of me just want, wants you to suffer as much as I am suffering. And just the fact that she was able to say the little girl inside of me and like distance a little bit from it and not just do a attack at that moment. Like, cause she did have an urge that her partner be punished but she didn't punish her partner and she sort of distanced a little bit from that urge and was aware that it was an urge and not like her whole self wanting that was so powerful, you know? So any way that you can distance from like just the immediate fight flight response is really helpful. Yeah. So um, what are the common triggers for those of vulnerability issues? I really want to say that we will have, and we talk a lot about it because every character strategy has a little bit of a different, um, a different thing that will tr trigger their issues around vulnerability and why it's hard for them to be vulnerable. We have an advanced training on that and we also have an SLN training in November. So check out SLN. Uh, we're going to talk in SLN and do our training on the different characters and how different kinds of vulnerability is going to impact that as well. So you're welcome to check that as well. Um, and then the question here is about somatica and um, people loved our demo. Thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, we do really believe in learning in person. Uh, we also understand that with the coronavirus, it might be more and more challenging. So we will anchor down and sit uh, and think about what we can do for people abroad and people that it's going to be more challenging to come over. Um, I cannot see at this point how Somatica can be completely offline and online and off, and, you know, like not in person. Uh, but we will try and create something that will allow people to do, people who really cannot come in to do it somewhat online and somewhat in person. But stay tuned. 
and 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 like doing the work of being with someone um attunement and you know all of the things we teach in somatica around embodied empathy uh do have this limbic component to them and you can get some limbic cues obviously off a of video or something like that but uh, to actually be with someone in the same room with their body there with you um, and their whole emotional being, you do link up with them in a way that is much more challenging in other mediums. And, and to be able to work with people around their body and their eroticism and their emotions, having some face-to-face uh, component feels so helpful to us. So we are really working to figure out like how to get some of this, these tools out there as widespread as possible because they're so helpful and also for training people who want to be coaches you know to really get that embodied piece is so helpful yeah um so we we are happy to answer if you have questions about the training we'll tell you a little bit about the training and how all of it is related to it and um also what is awaiting us um, so the training of vulnerability, as Celeste said, is a huge part of the training. It's there throughout all the modules, uh, whether we talk about shame, um, boundaries, capacities, what turns us on to um, really understanding our triggers, our feelings, um, and um, navigating repairing relationship vulnerability, as we said, is also the, the center of our method because we talk of, and we, we believe in vulnerability between coach and um, client as well as us as teachers. I'm repeating it because it is very novel in the world of coaching and, um, and therapy. Um, and um, we are planning to hold our trainings in person, each train, both in New York and in California. We hope we'll be able to start in July. We're planning to start both training in July and have a worst case scenario if we still have to adhere to um, shelter in place orders. Um, but if that's something that you you if that's something you're curious about and really want to do we encourage you to sign up early because the california training for example is already people connecting on facebook and they're already like reading materials and getting online components and we're going to start it soon for new york as well um so you will be since we, you are sheltered in place that's what we do in the webinars, by the way, is to bring you more materials you can engage with and start reading the books and start reading uh, the online component. The self-paced component is a wonderful way to get ready. Um, somebody asked how long is the program if it starts in July, um, when would it end? So the there's four four-day modules and they're spread over either between like four to six months. And so it's like you do about a module every month or month and a half. So if we start in July um, in New York, we'll be done in December. And if we, when we start in um, Berkeley uh, in July, we'll be done in January um, of next year. And all the dates are on the website uh, if you look for them. And I'm happy to post the link here as well. Or we'll send you a link in a follow-up email. We'll, we'll put it in here. Um, yeah, so the training is really for both people who want to be coaches and for people who just want to do this for personal growth and have much more. I always think like, what is the bottom line of Somatica? What do we want for people? And that is to have more joy, more pleasure, more erotic connection, more love, more intimacy, less pain, less trauma. Like, boom, if we can come out with, <laughs> with that from the training, you know, that's the real goal. And people who are doing it for professional development, you know, it, they've all said it completely changed their personal lives as well. Um, and, and a lot of people are coming now to be good goals. We just got somebody who said these are good goals. I agree, they're the best. <laughs> and, um, and it's just such an amazing community of humans who really care about each other and care for each other um, and are, are uh, supporting each other in their growth, um, you know, cheerleading each other when they make these steps 
loving each other and empathizing when people fall and um and helping each other in their professions grow and uh, be who they who they really want to be as um coaches and you know sometimes people are bringing it into other professions we had one guy who was like a tech guy and he came back with all of these tools and his boss said i actually am gonna have you be half time a coach to our to our to the other programmers and halftime uh, you'll be doing your own work because it because we need that kind of emotional intelligence um, it, it, with with you know folks uh, at their job as well so you know it can be taken it helps people in their job it helps people in their relationship with their kids um, because it's really about all types of intimacy yeah and uh, one of our graduates started the whole the whole um, uh, intimacy coordination for Hollywood. So people take somatic and the tools and take it to new places. The boudoir photographers, people really use it in different places and in different professions. And some people take it and really do somatica, pure coaching somatica with, um, yeah. yeah. So we want to just tell you a little bit about um, if you want to apply and you can find out tons more about the training at somaticainstitute.com. We have videos answering all sorts of questions. We have lots of um, information, blogs about the kinds of things that we teach. So you could really explore the website and find out if it feels compatible for you. And just for uh, joining this intro um, today, we also give an additional $200 off of the um, training tuition. The tuition is $7,200, um, and you can get uh, still get the early bird in New York at this point, and uh, that's a $250 discount. And then for people who can pay in full once they get accepted to the training, that's another $500 discount. And um, we do have some scholarships available uh, for uh, um, underserved populations, uh, low income, and some work trades still left. So you can apply for a scholarship on the site. Yeah, we do uh, offer you, um, I'm laughing because <laughs> someone asked me, they're gonna feel incomplete if you're not gonna see the painting. So here you go. It was a moment of emotional need to express myself and I was very much on fire and I just like made the sun here. I'm back. <laughs> okay. um, so we do ask you in order to get a 200 off is to sign up by tonight um, because that's it's a time limited offer um, the 200 off thank you so much for your positive um, compliments uh, we really love sharing these tools and just hope that they help you right away I really want to say there's a lot of fear around the coronavirus. Everyone is scared and for a good reason. It's not like it's not you're not not <laughs> if you're scared about it. It really is killing people. We're here. We had to modify things already. We're, we are flexible and working with logistics all the time and with our people. So we listen to what people have to say and we work with them both individually as there as needs shift and as a group. So um, I just want to reassure you around that. Um, yeah, as well. Right. Wonderful. So thank you so much for being yes. with us here today. Um, Somebody else is training a residential location. No, um, it's just a daytime training. So if you're coming from out of town, you would need to find a uh, residence to stay in um, Airbnb or a hotel. We also put up a Facebook group beforehand and a lot of people coordinate places to stay that way. Wonderful. So we will, we recorded this. You can also, we're going to post it on uh, Facebook and Somatica Institute um, anytime soon. So if you have other questions, you can always reach out to us either through the Facebook post or through info at solesandaniel.com. Um, and we we'll look forward to seeing more of you. And thank you so much for joining us in this beautiful day. Big hearts and big love to you all. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye.